disintegration of a democratic society and young people that are massively emigrating and that is probably one of the key problems in the Balkans. <laughs>
um, Baroque monuments all over the city. Skopje's architecture is more brutalism. This was very new, and Baroque shouldn't be new. Made out of cheap plaster, called so it's basically fall Baroque, and it was very um, criminal in terms of uh, how much money was spent on this project without the citizens' uh, citizens' approval. So nationalism, corruption, government nepotism. Billy, are these also some of the ingredients behind the plenums in 2014? And and uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about what happened then and what's happening today. Right. Uh, well, in 2014, basically, there was a huge uprise. A, uh, they weren't the first pr protests that took place in Bosnia. In fact, throughout the years, people have organized various protests and uh, various social groups actually represented themselves. But uh, time after time, they would uh, achieve some results only to have all those results erased uh, again and again be put back on, the, uh, on point zero. Uh, eventually, social justice, of course, was on decline. Uh, a year previous to 2014 to 2013, we had huge protests regarding the identity numbers, where uh, about 85% of the people supported a very simple demand that all people of Bosnia should have an identity number. Uh, behind closed doors, the government didn't abide by that demand. Uh, in 2014, February, people got extremely upset. Uh, basically, it started in Tuzla, uh, where workers were demanding better working conditions. Um, in Tuzla, there were various firms that were closing, and the government was selling off parts, and people were left without jobs and destitute uh, in places like Ditta. So that's a, a, a factory man manufacturer of uh, various detergents. Uh, workers actually uh, guarded the factory 24 hours a day at really cold temperatures. So they sat outside to make sure that no government official goes in and steals part of the, of the factory. Um, Dita is now back with the, with the workers. There are all kinds of issues going on. In Zenca and all, all, in various cities in Bosnia, uh, people came out to show support to, to workers of Tuzla and to show that they are also not happy. Uh, on the 7th, they accumulated to violent protests, where, as we've seen in pictures all over the world, uh, buildings were burning, police were being attacked. Uh, various cities handled in various ways, but um, basically plenums were created to try and prevent the violence and yet carry on the fight for improvements and for social justice. Uh, issues are hard to even count. So everything is an issue. There is no social group that can claim any kind of justice that they are happy in any way. Uh, we've tried to sort, it, sort them out, but initially there was so much anger that people just wanted to burn again. So even though they were happy to, to organize themselves into plenums and to try in a peaceful way, they very quickly lost faith that that can be accomplished. Um, Part of the problem is also people's and expectations. Today, what, what, what is happening with the experience? Today, of the basically, we went uh, because 2014, we also had elections. A number of people who were involved in Plenum went into politics. Uh, because of this, people turned against Plenum. People thought that Plenum betrayed them. And it took uh, a few months of uh, debate and, and telling people that Plenum hasn't changed, we, that Plenum is still just a citizen movement, that just individuals who were involved in Plenum went into politics, that it's not, you know, Plenum did not betray them, we're still on the same ground. Um, today we are now working a lot more with people, teaching, educating people, ha uh, mean, peaceful means of, of citizen fight. and. Um, I mean, very recent, most recent uh, protests were by uh, veterans, which were organized again throughout the country. So first they had a small one in Sarajevo, then uh, smaller ones in different parts of Bosnia. And uh, then they carried out a large pet uh, petition also um, in various cities in Bosnia. Uh, as far as I know, tens of thousands of uh, signatures were, were collected, which in terms of Bosnia, for example, one of our presidents has that many votes and he's a president. So I'm thinking that's you know, quite a large number of signatures. Uh, and we are working with various social groups of pensioners on one side, youth on the other side, and yet they are all, uh, we're trying to coordinate them. We're trying to build trust between them because th there is very little trust. Uh, in Bosnia, there is a, a very unique case where our system is such that uh, it depends on divisions. So our government is trying its utmost 
to uh, divide people on national grounds. Uh, people are, this is an additional thing that people have to fight in Bosnia. We have to constantly, I mean, from the very first day, so as soon as the protests happened in 2014, we were accused and basically it was like, who came out? Is it Croats, Bosniaks or Serbs? And I remember in Zenza, it was like, you see protests and mostly it's just Muslims. It's like, yeah, majority of people in Zenza are Muslims. That's normal. In fact, if that wasn't the case, then we would have a different problem. So it's really about educating and changing perspectives and standing up to, to lies and deceit. Danny, help, help me understand this. Uh, we've heard about Bosnia, uh, Macedonia. Uh, we could have uh, heard about uh, Belgrade and Serbia, the protests against the waterfront development and the mm -hmm. alleged corruption of the, of the ruling government in, uh, in facilitating that. We could have heard about Croatia and the protests uh, in, in, uh, in, in Zagreb. Um, is there some common denominator between these mobilizations in the Balkans? And also maybe if I can ask you, what is the relation that you think uh, is, is being built between protesters and uh, institutions and, and, and party politics? Because we've mm. seen that the politicians don't listen, but then mm. when you try to enter party politics, that also causes mm. a certain side effect. I think the common denominator in all of this uh, is the reason why there people are protesting is, is a great sense of injustice. And uh, it's motivated uh, by social injustice and injustice in terms of degradation of democracy. And you cannot express yourself freely and exercise your you know, basic human rights and you live because of it. The system treats you uh, discriminatively. You're not part of the uh, political, you're not part of the connected to the political class elite. You're basically a second class citizen. So you have injustices uh, demand, you know, deriving from the way that the system treats you. There is a lot of selective justice problems of rule of law. And there are also social injustices like worker rights getting uh, cut down, people living in extreme poverty. This is why, by the way, you see a lot of people trying to flee the Balkans and there was a bulk, there was a, a wave of economic migrants coming from the Western Balkans to the European Union. And the system doesn't try, and when I say the system, I mean the acting political class doesn't try to solve the problems of the people, but tries to repress them even further. Uh, and this creates another wave of anger, of burst of, of emotions. So I think this is the common denominator. There is a good thing in that because the people are not uh, fighting uh, against the system, but they are also fighting to, um, and they are reaching to each other, as uh, Meli has said, and trying to build within the society a better society to increase the trust uh, uh, with, it, with each other, but to come to a um, common denominator, what is it that we want, you know, and this is like redefinition and renegotiation or a political discussion or this, it's not political in terms of political actors, but it's discussion about politics. What are the core values that we want our society to be based on and share uh, to the maximum? And I think everywhere, it's, then this is the good side of the story, it's the same. We want democracy, we want liberty, and we want uh, social uh, justice. You know? Veronica, how, how does this relate to the situation in Hungary? We've seen a government that for many years now is criminalizing protest, is uh, 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 fighting dissent, including organized civil society NGO dissent. But we've also seen uh, a number of street protests, uh, including recently in favor of uh, welcoming refugees, when the government was instead putting one of the most, uh, one of the harshest policies of the European Union. We've seen protests in defense of freedom of the press, uh, Mila, one million for freedom of information a few years ago, and yet nothing seems mm -hmm. to, to change. If anything, things seem to be deteriorating in Hungary. How, how do you read the situation? Well, um, it is true that uh, not much has changed on the political level as a result of uh, the various demonstrations that have taken place over the last four or five years. Although over the last couple of months, um, um, another new movement of teachers and people working in the public education has uh, started, uh, which already had two quite major demonstration, demonstrations in Budapest, both times in pouring rain. These were the umbrella demonstrations, uh, which maybe started a longer term process because what was characteristic to the prior demonstrations was very much that uh, people went out on the street uh, for a certain cause, be it uh, the uh, media law or uh, the planned internet tax or corruption. Uh, they demonstrated for like two hours, then they went home um, without a clear vision, without a clear idea what to do next, how to do next. And they felt that they have done their part and did not continue mobilizing. So again, the problem in Hungary was uh, that uh, those who initiated these demonstrations 
Uh, they didn't really have a vision beyond uh, how to build up a movement, how to build up something more permanent than just coming together for two hours on the streets, and how to mobilize um, groups and communities from the bottom up, from the grassroots, so that people would want to participate in their own lives uh, on the local level and on the, on the everyday level. How do you think one addresses that? And I want to ask this to you, but also then open up a bit the discussion on this point. We've seen uh, in Spain, for instance, following the 2011 protests, after a period of two or three years, the protest movement of 15M, 15M has transformed itself into a political force. That is one avenue that some countries mm -hmm. have experienced. Um, what do you think about that option, or where do you think there can be the construction of a force that goes mm. beyond episodical protest? Well, unfortunately, in Hungary, we have debts more than 20 years <coughs> long. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. So debts in terms of uh, mobilization and active citizenship, like 20 years long. Uh, my theory is that uh, the um, political changes in 89-90 in, in Hungary have been very smooth, probably the smoothest all over the whole region. Um, and it was also very much generated top down. So the, basically the ruling communist party uh, gradually uh, renounced power and facilitated the change into a democratic uh, system. And the structures of democracy have been built up very quickly. Um, and in parallel with that, I think this led people to believe that everything is okay. We have the democratic institutions in place, we have the democratic uh, constitutional system in place, we are fine. And civil society, although of course we have quite a large civil society in Hungary, um, it wasn't as vocal or, or did not really um, talk a lot about upholding the democratic values and that we have to fight for these democratic values. And when the change came again after 2010, um, it was very easy to dismantle uh, the systems, uh, the democratic system and, and its uh, institutions because <coughs> the <coughs> Sorry again, uh, because people didn't realize what they had, what how important uh, it was what they had. 2010 or, is when Orbán comes yeah, to power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in my opinion, in Hungary, we unfortunately or fortunately have to really start again from the very grassroots um, and to work, go back to the local level and start to work with local localized small groups of activists broaden these circles mobilize people make people want to participate um, provide them with tools and skills to be able to participate uh, which is of course a long-term project but i'm afraid that without literally laying this this groundwork for democracy and active citizenship uh, no protests will have lasting um, results and your strategy in Macedonia, in the midst of the protest well, wave now? I mean, a protest movement can do one of, or, or of two things. Either prove something is bad or just re reinforce something that people believe is good. It's either a plus or a minus. It's not, not nowhere in the middle. It's not proposing a new political approach. It's either criticizing or, change, or either preventing or changing something that's taking place. And for instance, people are losing a lot of trust. Uh, civil society is pushed in a corner in autocratic um, uh, governments where it's not consulted in anything, it faces either a policy or something that happens that is negative and it tries to prevent it. And that creates a setting where civil society is seen always as someone who is opposing the government, as someone who is against the government, as someone who is um, someone who needs to be discredited. And that kind of diminishes the relevance of civil society. Another thing is that people are starting to lose a lot of faith in the politi political and policy approach. Mm -hmm. For instance, these past we, this past week in Macedonia has been marked by the student protests we mentioned. There is a student parliament at all universities in Macedonia, and le legally, uh, on a legislative way, students have uh, a high percent of votes in all governing bodies. It's even higher than some of the European Union member states. However, this has always been usurped and taken away from the students by an elite and very um, governmentally um, in favor sort of saying group. Uh, and the last situation was that due to the student protests, basically the student parliament never re-elected. So they've been over their mandates for two years and the students were pushing for a reform and then elections. Thinking it's the summer and there's no stud students in the academic uh, community, they scheduled these student elections, which resulted in very few votes. It resulted in the student plenum monitoring the elections 
and uh, the student parliament noticing how terrible the situation is, basically stealing electoral boxes, running with them in their hands across the streets, hiding them in different buildings. And the students basically, the student plenum, called the police saying, they're stealing the boxes, they should count the votes here. Police said, we're not in charge, we're not, we don't have any mandate to work on this. A few hours later, police forces came in and violently threw the student activists outside of the student parliament's office. Uh, with huge police presence, with water cannons parked right, side, uh, right outside of the street. And the university today just said, you know what, this is fine, we'll accept the new mandates of whoever was elected through criminal elections. And if this can happen in something like student organizing, what can happen in real elections, for instance? And that's why people lose faith. But for instance, I'd say list two short things about maybe trying to find a permanent way to change things. Macedonia civil society is currently um, drafting a way out of the crisis, a blueprint, sort of say, that is proposing concrete measures and concrete urgent areas that are going to improve the, 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 the life in the country in the nearby future. Another approach is the colorful revolution, gathering support for civil society participation in overcoming the political crisis. These are very specific approaches that are several levels above just the protests on the street. But even only if it were a protest movement, it does matter a lot because it matters in aspect of allowing and reinforcing the notion that citizens are here to speak their mind, the citizens have the right to protect their own rights, and in creating a culture where the citizen is an active participant in one society compared to what uh, the reality is that they're trying to be more oppressed. Mm. Let me ask then a question starting with you, introducing also the term uh, coined by the Prime Minister of Hungary of uh, illiberal democracy. Well, not coined by him, but appropriated by him for public reuse. Uh, and it, it, we, we clearly see um, a dissolution of the, of the state of, of the rule of law, of uh, basic democratic principles and safeguards uh, at the, at the, in the neighborhood of the European Union, obviously in countries such as Turkey, but also the very core of the European Union. We've mentioned Hungary, we've mentioned Poland. To what extent is the uh, lack of a capacity of the European Union to guarantee basic values and democratic freedoms within the countries that are part of the Union jeopardizing uh, its uh, moral uh, capacity mm. to also influence what's happening in, in countries mm. such as those of the I Western mean, Balkans. And to what extent is that it's validating precisely those actions of a government by showing that authoritarian democracy mm. is an option, actually. I today. mean, it, this has uh, uh, happened, all of these dynamics, in the face of the European Union. And to a certain extent, the European Union has been complicit. Uh, being very uh, late to react in case of Orban, despite warning signs in the beginning, even to a certain ex uh, extent supporting Gruevski, because you know the European Union has its own share of problems, but one of the problems that it has its own paradigm into approaching things where it's favoring more stability than democracy. So it has really put the lid on a lot of the burning issues, especially in regards to the Western Balkans. And when it came, you can see it in, for example, when it came to the uh, managing the uh, migrant crisis, the, one of the preferred options of some of the countries within the European Union was to close to Western Balkan routes. And these authoritarian governments that played bold, they got on the good side of the European Union. And then, you know, a lot of the problems that were happening internally and the suffering of the people in terms of injustice, social and democratic degradation were overlooked. So in that sense, you know, we should not have a lot of expectation for the European Union because it's a complex setup of institutions uh, and all that, but we should be critical of it, that they should recognize that it's a problem not only of being a morally corrupt political union, but it's also a problem of the functioning and stability of the union. I mean, Brexit didn't came for nothing. Problems within the European Union are not for nothing. We need to uh, not, uh, not reinvent, but reinvigorate the democracy all around, all around the continent. Speaking to the, uh, about the Balkans, this is an issue of the stability of the European Union. If there is a, a the tri, uh, you know, political instability in the Western Balkans, then this is an issue for the stability of the wider, of the wider continent. What the social movements are doing, and which is a good thing, is you know, changing the agenda completely changed the agenda for, uh, you know, from uh, trade horse, in previously we had horse trading of democracy for stability, now the citizens saying, no, 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 we need democratic, we want democratic transformation. We cannot any longer have 
uh, you know, selective justice processes. We cannot disregard the rule of law. In Macedonia, let me just, you know, illustrate, not to be just theoretical. We had examples, I'll give you two examples where people got in prison and got fined. One person got in prison for stealing three, uh, three kilos of meat, barbecue meat, and he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. You can imagine why somebody would steal meat, three kilos of meat, to feed, you know, his family. Three and a half years in prison. Another person, older person, senior citizen, pensioner, living on 50, 60 euros per month, was selling salad at the market. His, the total value of the salad he was selling was less than uh, 10 euros, literally less than 10 euros. Police and inspectors comes and he gets a fine for, with 150 euros. So, you know, they were clearly in the breach of law, but you, you see an extremely repressive reaction towards this citizen to our individuals who are in a dire, who are to totally uh, socially excluded and marginalized. And then you have a political class spending 600 millions in the center of the Skopje for facelifting of the city and for monuments. Five, uh, we have uh, uh, reports from different organizations looking at financial in uh, integrity that over the course of the 10 years while they're in power, 5 billion euros have left the country into offshore accounts and all that. And when the special public prosecutor looks into that, 56 people within the political cats that get pardoned by the president. I think, you know, the social movements mm -hmm. and the reactions in Macedonia are not overestimated. If anything, they are underestimated, but that is no longer possible. Not in Macedonia, I think also not in Bosnia and in other places. People want to reclaim and reinvigorate democracy, and the sooner the European Union uh, recognizes that and supports that, the, the better it will be for our societies and for, the, for everybody also with, that is on board. Well, the point with the EU is uh, that it is basically composed of 28 nations, that means 28 governments. And the EU has always functioned uh, through negotiations and compromises. If you look at any particular policy issue in the EU, uh, the way EU policies are made is really through a series of compromises because all the 28 countries have the different uh, national interests. And um, you can look at whichever sector, like agriculture is a very uh, typical point in, in question, uh, that they, the agricultural policies are developed through a series, a set of different compromises serving the interests of one member state and another member state and the third member state. Um, and uh, this mode of action um, seems to be that is not able to uphold the basic values because uh, that's the only mode of action the EU has ever known uh, to work through negotiations and through compromises. Uh, but if it comes to issues that you can't compromise on, uh, and still um, you don't know other ways to work, then, then, then you come to a standstill or a, or a kind of a dead end. So this is why I think it is very difficult to, to achieve changes through the European Union unless we work to achieve changes at home. And this is why these movements um, and the civic mobilization is important because these countries, all countries, can't really rely on anybody else to solve their own problems. They can receive solidarity and support. I think it's, that's very important as well. Uh, but the initiative have, has to come from within. But if you can say something, you know, we live in a times of the mode is representative democracy because we are all large entities, a lot of people, it's difficult to manage, you know, uh, other forms of, de of democracy, but what we are lacking is participatory mechanisms and more delibera debila debil mm -hmm. deliberation and processes of that, of that sort. Uh, now these movements, you know, you ask what is the way to change the, uh, the, to introduce change into politics. Podemos is one of the options. It's not unforeseeable that, you know, many of the social movements will transform themselves and uh, go into political life and form political parties. Other option is to create more synergies and cooperation with some of the political parties. In Macedonia currently, there is, uh, because the parties in the civil society movement and the parties in opposition have a common agenda and they have a common enemy, an authoritarian government. So there is uh, a two-step process. Part of the social movements have transformed and made a new political party. and the then, but all of them are in communication with the parties in opposition. So I don't think that there is a cookie cutter. There is, there is not one size fits all uh, solution. Different 
forms will be uh, tried, but it's important to, to have the outcome. As I said, you know, a strategic plan and a real transformation, both systemic and also on the policy level. It, I, th I think it's also important to go back a little bit in terms of European Union, but however, the importance of European Union and how much it can bring uh, to us as a region, uh, because Bosnia has this element called OHR, which you know, Office of Higher Representatives, uh, Higher Representative, uh, Europe almost has a finger in Bosnia. Uh, in fact, it, it has more power than our government officially. Uh, it doesn't use that power. However, citizens are banking on that because citizens almost, you know, we have 14 governments, so 3.5 million people and 14 governments, that's uh, you know, half of what Europe has. Um, people know that these governments cannot agree. They, there's, just, there's 13 min ministers for education, 13 ministers for healthcare. They never ever agree. Maybe you Throw can explain in. to us briefly why there are 13 ministers for education. Uh, and for <laughs> everything else. <clears throat> Okay, well basically uh, the way Bosnia functions, so we'll, we'll leave aside municipalities, that's local level, that's 143 municipalities, ignore them. Uh, Bosnia is then structured so you have a national level, which doesn't have that many um, uh, issues for, to sort out or, or responsibilities on its own. Then you have 10 cantons, these 10 cantons form one of the entities which is uh, federal, um, and then you have Republika Srpska, the other entity, uh, plus you've got Bačko district. So that's Bočko district, 10 cantons, that's 11, plus two entities, that's 13, plus national level, that's 14, uh, plus the OHR and then the municipality levels, uh, which basically means that no one is accountable for anything. This is why we often claim in Bosnia that we would have accomplished so much more as citizens and as, as movement if we just had one person accountable, if we just knew who is accountable. For two and a half years, I've just been going around in circles from mm. one door to the so next. the fragmentation Look, of power is actually yes. fighting against you. In yes, case. and every, every response responsibility is divided. So uh, whichever problem, whether it's pensions or a stray dogs issue, uh, one part has responsibility over this bit, the other part has over this bit. They haven't done their bit, so we can't do our bit. So we force these guys to do what they need to do. They haven't done the right job. So it's constantly going round and round in circles. Um, basically, th this leads to because people in Bosnia have been active and uh, uh, they've lost all hope that citizens have any power at all. Uh, our three presidents don't have 20% of the vote of the voting body. So I, you know, who are they representing? And we're trying to tell Europe, you know, when you, when you listen to these guys, can you just bear in mind that they're not representing us? Basically, government in Bosnia is the biggest employer. Uh, by the time all their employees and the families vote for, for whoever gave them the job, that's, you know, they already have considerable a number of votes. Um, a lack of uh, changes that people bring about from, through their efforts leads to depression. And I think in Bosnia we, we are now going through that phase trying to get people active again after a period of serious depression where they thought, that's it, uh, our government is not going to do anything because why would they, they're, they're fine. Our government is absolutely fine. Um, on the other hand, OHR is unwilling to do anything. However, the presence of OHR, whenever we do something, it's the pressure from that side and from us, from, the, from below, that basically makes changes happen. So uh, people, despite all, the, all that happened before, people still feel that in Europe there's more chance for this ethical uh, or moral ground uh, and that maybe OHR will listen to them and will hear their call because you know what they are asking for is really quite rational. Uh, however, uh, people don't uh, expectations play a big role. People kind of come out to protests and uh, they think that the changes are going to happen tomorrow. And uh, breaking through this and making people realize that no, it's a long haul. It's the difference between I think our region and Spain. In Spain, people knew that it's going to be a long battle and it's going to be about one day at a time. You know, in Bosnia, we're now doing a little project called uh, Stop litter, Littering. It's not about throwing litter on the street. It's about showing how when one person does it, it's you know, no big deal. But if 100 people do it, then it's a big deal. And it's the same with everything else. You know, you build a castle one stone at a time. You make a bread one bit at a time. So it's about n knowing that, yes, you as an individual are not, you know, you don't have that much power, but you have to act and you can't ignore the power that you do have, because if you do ignore that, then, then we are done for. <clears throat> Coming back to the EU for one more point, I think 
Well, uh, transparency and participation are issues that the EU could itself work a lot more on. Uh, one example or one case um, is the TTP, uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership um, Agreement or planned agreement uh, with the US. Uh, one of the reasons why it sparked so much protest all over Europe basically is that uh, the negotiations up to a very long uh, or up to very recently have been going on behind completely closed doors and people felt that uh, um, about something that uh, really affects or influences their everyday life, um, it is being decided above their heads. So it's the EU itself that should open up more to participation and I mean um, measures or tools like the European Citizens Initiative are far from being enough to, to make Europe really participatory. How do you read the actions of the EU towards Hungary? There was some attempt at uh, mitigating some of the worst legislative uh, processes that the European government has passed, but those always seemed at once both too much and not enough. Not enough to change policies really, but too much in the sense that they were hijacked by the European government uh, and were utilized to mobilize actually the Hungarian people against uh, this external uh, force of the European mm -hmm. Union that wanted to tell mm -hmm. Hungarians how to live. First of all, I believe that um, when the changes in Hungary uh, started, uh, the first example was the media law back in 2010. Um, I, I think first uh, European politicians or, or uh, the representatives of the EU institutions couldn't really believe that this is happening and were really kind of uh, powerless or toolless uh, to, to do anything about it. Um, and again, uh, what I just said before, this very technical nature of the EU has prevented uh, the organization from really acting up or, or making uh, tangible changes. By technical, I mean that they, for example, looked at the media law and uh, uh, looked at uh, certain provisions um, that these are um, in contrary uh, or these are not in line uh, with European, uh, this and this European uh, regulation. Uh, but, um, but the Commission um, can basically only look at uh, this from, from, from this perspective, looking at the, each of the individual paragraphs and causes, uh, clauses in the legislation without looking at the whole picture. And, and the government could easily change the given clauses or the given paragraphs while at the same time leaving the whole uh, system and especially its implementation uh, in place. Um, I don't exactly know how, what else, or how else differently the, the Commission or the various EU institutions could have acted, I don't know. Um, but that's just again, as I said, is, uh, is coming from the nature of the EU, how it, how it um, functions and how it operates. But to that point, for instance, Macedonia has had some tolerable country reports. Uh, done by the EU and then in the moment of political crisis and scandals unfolding an expert commission is assembled to do an urgent report in terms of surveillance, in terms of judiciary, in terms of uh, ombudsman work and that report is just staggering. It seems like there are two documents that are referring to a different country, not the same country because you cannot have the progress reports saying you know it's not that bad and have this thing here saying that the institutions are not functioning at all. A similar situation happens when we assess the completion of policies but not the quality of those policies, not the impact of those policies and not the way in which they were made. The EU focuses on whether a law was adopted or not but not on how that law came to be, who participated in its making it. We have a hyperactive assembly that is passing laws by the minute and this is not even a joke. Like we are actually, I don't know if we've passed the number of laws that are going through assembly in a shortened procedure with less debate as if urgent when they're in fact not. And this creates policies that one can be harmful to are not really um, consulted in, in their approach and are not expert made but are kind of compiled bits and pieces from different policies that don't even fit the country and are not really implemented. So the impact is we have the legislation but no change comes to the life. And when we come to the movements like when people try to speak their minds and voice they op their opinions, there's a whiplash, a whiplash coming from media, from governmental structures saying that you're traitors, you're uh, foreign agents, you're spies, you're whatever, you're, and a lot of different uh, words that have come to have negative meanings when in fact they shouldn't. And even the active, particularly young people that are trying to make a change become oppressed and stigmatized and their future doesn't lie 
in the, in the country they've been raised and they're trying to fix, but in another country that will accept them and in another society they can actually contribute to. And you find yourself in a situation where a country is fighting with corruption, with poverty, um, with um, just a disintegration of a democratic society and young people that are massively emigrating and that is probably one of the key problems in the Balkans. A lot of people with really quality education, I mean a lot of people with attained high levels of education, with a lot of capacity, with a lot of understanding of civil society are leaving their countries because they're losing the sense of perspectivity there. And there was a joke that kind of illustrates this thing. I mean Macedonia has had, we don't, the government is hiding the numbers but it's hundreds of thousands of people that have left the country. And one joke goes that, you know, whoever stays last can turn the lights off, and another goes that a country with youth like this shouldn't worry about the future of Germany. Yeah. Um, I need to wrap it up, but perhaps uh, Bidi Dania, I just ask you for a one minute each on medium term perspectives in Bosnia and in the region. Uh, What's coming up? Uh, over the, over well, the next year in Bosnia. I'm, I'm a lot more concerned with Bosnia. I, I do uh, work with the region, but I think in Bosnia we've got so many issues that uh, we really have to look into. Uh, youth in Zenta, at least, and I hope this continues, is waking up and is standing up. And uh, it needs to be said that this is still high school children. Uh, basically, we try to work with children at university. They are already too afraid to take part in activism, mostly because now their education is not free, their parents are paying for it, and if they get involved in activism, their parents are then persecuted, uh, there's mobbing going on and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we are now looking at uh, children and educated, educating them how to uh, formulate policies, how to say what the problem is, how to uh, build a better future at least in three, four, five years time. But in Bosnia we have a problem with the system where you know, they are on a ship, we are teaching them how to sail but the anchors are down and somebody needs to lift up those anchors if, if we want to move forward. Um, so at the moment we are kind of dividing between those who have the future in their hands and us, you know, people who need to sort out the past so that the future can happen. Uh, and at the moment I think that you know, my, my, it's like 12 hours a day <laughs> you know, working with citizens and working with politicians and the international community and the media and trying to be, bring it all together because you know, there are too many actors, there are too many players. We do understand that th there are also extremist groups that we have to deal with. It's not the only country that has extremist groups um, and it's not nothing to be afraid of. It's, I think you know, we, we can face it. Um, but it is about stepping over you know, and perhaps upsetting some people who are now talking big talk but don't really have a backbone to stand on. Well, in the midterm, in the next couple of years, I think in the Balkans the revolution will continue. So you will see a tension between the political class that is becoming uh, more irresponsible, less democratic governance, more repressive, more authoritarian, extending their finger in, a, in many pies and eng engaging more and more into political criminality. And we see a rise and mounting of social pressures because, as I said, you know, either this degradation of democracy, so you lose freedom, or you know, the social injustices keep on the uh, social inequalities keep on rising in the Balkans. They are uh, much higher than they are in the in the European Union. So we will see that tensions kind of uh, kind of continue. Uh, there are possible uh, ways out. Um, some of them could be assisted, the way uh, could be paved. People are, are uh, uh, c uh, they can be assisted, they could be helped and or mitigated. The ter democratic transformation can be mitigated by the European Union. One of the, you know, as we are sitting here uh, engaging in a civil society forum, there is a meeting of the heads of states happening not very far from here in the same city in Paris. Uh, and, but they are discussing very technical things, and this is what we have criticized here, this uh, technical, bureaucratic, uh, technocratic approach about connectivities, you know, that will not really, connectivity agenda, transport energy, that will not really uh, change the everyday life of the people. What we need is uh, to have the rights and the needs of the citizens to be heard much more and to be acted upon them and by be acted upon them I mean you know more social uh, cohesion but the social cohesion first of all what I think is a positive thing but is happening by the virtue of the social movements and more protests we are 
creating more cohesive societies. We are deliberating between ourselves what is the values that we are coming, and I think this is a this is a good start. I think you know in the foreseeable future, the Balkans and the whole region will come out out of this more democratic, more free, and more with a greater with a higher social solidarity. But in the meantime, if you ask me, we need to continue our fight for it. Well. Uh at least one thing Brexit makes clear, and that uh, the king is naked, that there is no longer uh, an Italian anomaly with Berlusconi or a Hungarian anomaly with Orban or a Polish anomaly with Kaczynski or a Balkan anomaly in Serbia or in Croatia or in other countries, but uh, anomalies becoming the norm, precisely. That there is uh, an economic system that is based on injustice and social exclusion, that there is a political system which is based on the, on the disenfranchisement uh, of individual citizens' right to participate in decision-making that is making that are resulting in a majority of the population of, of Europe, geographically understood, European Union or not, feel disenfranchised, feel outside of the political game, and that is leading to a disintegration of the European Union as we know it today. And so taking back the fight for democratic governance, taking back the fight for economic equality, taking back the fight for social cohesion, which once upon a time, and we are in Paris, used to be called fraternité or fraternity, uh, is also a fight uh, to reinforce and stabilize, in fact, the institutions that we're now inhabiting and that fight is as much about countries that now lie within the European Union as those that are currently outside of the European Union. No, nowhere I think in the recent past have the problems and also the possible way out being as closely connected uh, between, uh, between the European region. Let us hope that that's an awareness uh, from which we can restart and not uh, an awareness uh, that leads to um, a, a, a the fulfillment of a prophecy that unfortunately is a negative one. I think our duty is to be optimistic and certainly when I always bring together and have a chance to speak with us activists, social forces, people working in NGOs, in academia, uh, that fills me with enthusiasm and hope and ambition to change uh, the status quo with one uh, concrete and final understanding that the status quo, whatever you do, is not going to remain and is no longer going to hold. And it's up to us to decide what to make of it. Thank you all very much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.